Hi, I'm Shantanu Paul, and I'm the CEO and founder of Talent Sprint. The word boot camp has a fascinating history. In early 19th century, the US military recruits used to wear boots, and hence the training camp for new recruits was called boot camp. Over time, this work started to mean an intense training program for a newbie to any field. In the US, software boot camps took off about two decades ago, in which students would immerse themselves in learning to code with the expectation of building a career in tech. In this episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, your host Akshay Dutt is talking with Dr. Shantanu Paul, the founder of the edtech startup Talent Sprint. Talent Sprint is the market leader in high-end deep tech boot camps for young working professionals, helping them to acquire new age tech skills which open up lucrative career opportunities for them. In this conversation, Shantanu talks about the journey of building up Talent Sprint with very little external capital, pivoting from an offline business to an online business, getting acquired by NSC and the road ahead for Shantanu. Listen on and if you like such insightful conversations with disruptive startup founders then do subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app. I let so my career is that I was heading over to India for 5 years and we went public at Nasdaq and all of that good stuff. But that apart the real interesting journey here was that I realized that how shallow the Indian talent story is and was even at that time. And maybe 5% of Indian college students have the great good fortune of going to world-class institutions. I was one of them. Then 95% of the colleges were offering pretty shoddy education, giving up degrees. And when we went to interview with the market, we realized that to hire two good new engineers, we would interview 100 people. So our strike rate was 2%. And I thought something was very seriously wrong with this picture. So a lot of my friends at that time in industry, we were, used to keep talking about the so-called skill gap, right? I was also active in NASCOM and uh, other industry bodies. And uh, the favorite armchair topic of discussion was, how do we solve the skill gap? Somebody should solve it. Academia is doing this wrong. Colleges need to do a better job. And after a few years of that, once I was done with Vertusa and Vertusa was already on its way to become a big company. And I thought I should go and do something new. And this time I should do something India facing and not US facing. I How many people did you hire those five years? At Wood? Or like, how many were you hiring every year? So you want to guess the total number in five years? 10,000? I don't know. I, I swear I don't <laughs> it was 6,000. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was a very large hiring operation and nonstop hiring operation. And, and I think that, I think we all had almost, I would say, a repetitive stress injury aside from that experience. And we realized that this is not the way to look at talent. We figured that we need a new solution in place where we realized that we can't just lecture the colleges and tell them to do a better job. They just don't have the system for it. And it is not, the college's job is not to produce. And I have a strong view, which many people in industry disagree with. My view is that a college education is not supposed to make you learn the skills of a job in a particular company. College education should prepare you for problem solving. You should be able to solve good problems in a good way. You should develop the skill of problem solving in college. That, unfortunately, colleges in India don't teach. I think American colleges teach problem solving. Indian colleges don't. So I figured that it was not the curriculum in the college that was the problem. It was how it was being taught that was the problem. So I always say that India's problem is not what is being taught. India's problem is how it is being taught. And, and therefore, we felt that we should build a new company. But that was the talent sprint story. And uh, that we can sit as a very sort of nice clearinghouse between the colleges on one side and companies on the other and produce talent through a B2C model where the student would pay for their learning and not the company. And creating this high-end programming and coding bootcamp. A lot of people used to call it finishing school, but I used to joke and say, finishing school gives the impression that there's a cake and you're putting icing, but that when there's no cake, when there's no cake, there's nothing, no icing to put. So I figured that we call it a software coding bootcamps. And that's how challenge would happen. Uh, had bootcamp as a terminology taken off back then? Today, the word bootcamp is used a lot by a lot of edtech companies, but was it? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was definitely taking off at that time. I think by 2010, the word bootcamp had started. U.S. also, if you look at the U.S. market, the coding bootcamp started to appear in 2012. Some of the early ones, like uh, General Assembly, Flatiron, they're all 2012 vintage companies. So yeah, I think it was just about the time the word bootcamp was coming up because 
The reason for that is what we ran inside the companies in IT. For example, if you look at TCS and Postgres or even Virtusa, when we hire students, we bring them into our companies and put them in the so-called bootcamp. So the word bootcamp is already in use inside the company. So we just made it a public bootcamp. That's all put outside the company. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah. And you were really like the perfect founder to start this. You spent close to a decade in colleges in the US. Uh, so yeah. you saw how US education, you saw a best-in-class education system and how it works very intimately, which gave you a certain thesis on what needs to be done. And then you spent time in tech companies and then you spent time hiring 6,000 people over a five-year period. So it's like a, that connecting the dots, like, like that really happened pretty well here. Yeah, no, nice of you to say that. I think, I think there is some truth to that. But I also say that sometimes I say that my problem is that I look at the supply side of any situation that I'm in and I find the inefficiencies and I then try to form the company on those next supply side. So I tell people that if I do it long enough, I'll end up building a primary school. Okay, that's interesting. What This is like a very philosophical question. There are two ways to look at building a business. One is that you focus on building demand and if there is demand, then you will figure out supply. Or the second is you focus on creating supply. If you create good quality supply, the demand will come. What is your view of this? No, I think it's not really either or. I don't think demand implies that supply will happen or supply implies that demand will appear. I think one has to match it. That's the whole idea of a platform company, right? Any company that serves as a platform has to bring two sets of stakeholders to the platform. On one side are people who have a need, and other side are people who have another set of needs, and the platform connects the needs, right? In our case, we had a B2B side, which is the conference, which need talent, which is ready to deploy. They don't want to spend money and time trading people. And then on the other side, there are people who need jobs, who can't get those jobs because they don't have the skills. So uh, on one side, we have learners, and on the other side, we have recruiters. And in a good platform business, you realize that you have to subsidize one side to make the other pay for it, right? So typically in this case, so if you look at Google as a business, right? It basically subsidizes all of us through our search and through our maps and through our YouTube participation. It keeps us engaged long enough so that it can sell advertising to us, right? So you always have to make one side come in for free so the other side will pay for that access. So in our case, in after a lot of debate, we concluded in talent sprint that we have to make the jobs free. So the company should come in and able to hire with no friction. So that just like they go to a campus and hire in a college, we have to make talisman be a new kind of virtual campus and make that free. But then when the jobs start to appear, the students will come and pay you money to be in that system. And that is Which also like correlates with the existing consumer behavior because existing right. behavior is the same. You pay for a college education. You're not yes. paying for the degree, but you're paying for a job that you get as a result. That's right. So you had this idea that you want to build an upskilling company focused on employability. So from that idea to actually launching it. Tell me about that journey. Yes. So essentially, as I mentioned last time, I was working at Virtusa at that time, leading a large organization of a few thousand people. And this was again a plunge into the unknown because first time I was changing multiple axes. And let me spend a minute on this because this, I think, is useful information for entrepreneurs. So when I moved from my comfort zone of IT services company for a global market, I moved multiple axes in one shift. For example, I went from a technology business to an education business. I went from a B2B customer base to a B2C customer base. And I went from an international customer clientele to a domestic Indian clientele. All three were pretty radical shifts. And I think if I had thought about it deliberately at that point in time, I might have scared myself. But in hindsight, I realized that one of the struggles of why it took us so long to get Talent Sprint going, the early days, one of the struggles that I'd love to talk about is because I think as entrepreneurs, as the leading team, we were essentially moving into a, going away from a comfort zone to a completely new way of doing things for a different market with a different set of priorities. I think that was certainly an interesting experience. So anyway, long story short, I quit my job at Virtusa, gave them like some four or five months notice saying that I'm happy to transition and I'll be leaving. And, uh, and that was a good move because it also led to some of my former colleagues who I'd worked with before, who had also at that time working in large multinational companies, there was a common view among many of us that we should do something in the space. And some of us came together at that time. And I'm happy to report that of that maybe 10 member team that got together in those days, 12 years ago, I think happy to report that five of us are still in the same place. So that's not a bad accomplishment as a yeah. core team. Hmm. Yeah. So and then that has been the heart of it. came together as co-founders or like some were co-founders, some were early employees? 
Yeah. So yeah. So we had co-founders and founding team members. So we were about ten of us, and and then uh, three of us were, I think, more along the lines of the senior team. So me and my former co-founder Madhumurthy and Jay Joel, three all of us were running multinational companies at that time. And we all had this great inspiration that we should go do something more meaningful. I think the purpose, I think a purpose-driven company, the idea of an impact thesis, all of that excited us. And if you remember the time, 2008, 2009 was also a time before the global crisis, of course. But 2007, 2008, India was going at 8 9%. The economy was booming. The IT sector just before the global crisis was doing really well. And there was a lot of bullishness that we all had saying that good time to do this. So yeah, I think it was a leap of faith. I think a lot of people asked me subsequently that what's wrong with you guys leaving comfortable jobs in large multinational companies and going out and roughing it up in the education space. I always said that I, I make fun of it by saying that I tried to play golf for a while and I got really forward. So I had to do a startup. Yeah, <laughs> they say that the best made plans was to meet reality. They rarely survived that. What were some of those early struggles? You had a plan in mind, but uh, I'm sure there must have been a lot of struggle until you finally found your footing. Uh, tell me about that. I think the biggest struggle was external. Just as we were starting the company, the global crisis happened. And with that, a lot of the enthusiasm that was there in general in the market, the euphoria was evaporating. I remember we had said that we should raise capital quickly. And, and then capital raise became a real difficulty. Within six months or nine months of starting, we realized that we would have to really bootstrap for a while before we could raise money. The other thing that was very interesting, again, is that I remember when I was heading Virtusa and when we had gone public in our NASDAQ, a lot of my friends told me, oh, now from this point on, whenever we start a company, raising money will be like a breeze. And sure enough, all of us have to believe all this stuff about ourselves. And then when we started and we realized that, man, the markets are really in terrible shape. And uh, raising money became a real struggle. So we decided that we're going to bootstrap for a while. And then that was a good idea. In fact, it focused us on creating the first set of coding boot camps. We were creating software testing engineers because we had a friendly company called App Labs. And App Labs was growing and they were a software testing company. And they gave us this big mandate to say that whoever you can produce through your code software testing boot camps will hire them all. And that gave us a lot of momentum. So it took us a year to recalibrate and say that money is not going to come easy in terms of investment. But but that actually forced us to behave well. And I think I must say that it's a behavior change that happened early, which is very fortunate because we started focusing on not losing money. And what did you price these boot camps at? And uh, how, how did you do the go-to market? How did you acquire customers? What was the first cohort size? Did you do it through tech from day one or was it that through classroom? traditional delivery and then gradually evolved. Like, tell me about that. Sure. The price points were about 40,000 rupees, which was in those days, and not a small sum of money for a young college graduate looking for a job. So we decided to be seen as a premium player and not a vanilla low cost player. And then we decided to do it physically for the first few cohorts, because that's how you build that high touch and feel. And also, I think a big part of, in my view, this kind of education, and I think all education, is inspiration. Students don't learn because they're uninspired, right? It is a myth that all that happens in a classroom is just content. I don't think that's true. I think what happens in a classroom is content, peer learning, peer pressure, inspiration, motivation, all of that comes together in a physical setting. So the first few cohorts, the first few years, in fact, were all physical classroom driven and uh, price points of 40,000 rupees. Luckily for us, like I said, very quickly, one after another, first App Lab, then Polaris, Quite a few companies started giving us these large mandates. And with that, we grew. I think, before you know it, in a year's time after that, so suddenly I was getting inbound calls from investors. Uh, uh, these mandates were essentially like a like a soft commitment that folks that you are training, we will take them through our interview process and hire them. That's correct. And exactly that. Hmm. And uh, the soft commitment turned out to be really good because we realized that the quality of our training was sufficiently high that 80-90% of people being interviewed were picked up. Immediately. And so we had a 80-90% placement rate out of the gates. But for the first cohort, how did you acquire students? Like getting students to pay 40K is not an easy uh, I think it was credibility. See, the good thing is that by the time we had come out of our previous companies, we already had as co-founders, myself, Madhu, Jay, we all had sufficient industry credibility. And people somehow believed that if we were training young, somehow they would find jobs. There was a leap of faith as well. I don't want to deny the first cohort was probably 50 students. But then uh, once those 50 students cracked it within three months of starting and they were all in these companies, then it became a very easy flow after that. Then the word of mouth spread and then you know, the students, this is a very herd mentality. The students are a very tight peer group. 
And so that, I think we got first our problem of talent acquisition through acquisition very fast after we got started. I think in some sense, one of the things that entrepreneurs have to watch out for is their own psychology, right? I think we were wasting time thinking about how to raise money. But in fact, the moment we started focusing on how to run product and build customers and then deliver, I think we were on our way. Amazing. Okay. This obviously is like upfront payment. So therefore it funds your expenses because students pay upfront the entire amount. That's the beauty of our business model. It's a negative working capital, which means that we collect before we deliver. And I must say that has been one of the mainstays of how you can build a company of this type without raising too much capital. In fact, we're a very capital efficient company for that reason, that very often what happens is you're able to get working capital from the market as from customers. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. And so uh, did you hire trainers? Were you training yourself? Like how did core yeah. product of education, how did that evolve? Yeah, there were two geniuses in my team. One was, of course, Madhu Murthy, my co-founder, who was a software testing expert with a great reputation. He had, previous to that, he was heading the testing practice for Accenture. So he came and the first few cohorts he taught himself on the software testing side. And the, once the testing side started doing really well, and I started getting calls from companies saying that, can we do developers, software developers? which is a higher bar, actually. And then I made a sort of another interesting move. I called this guy called Ashokan Pichai, who was still our chief learning officer. And Ashokan had been our head of training at Butchusa and had built this amazing reputation for superb programming skills development in the young students. So I called him. He wasn't, I think he was at Mafua at that time. He was the CTO of Mafua. He was in Chennai. And I called him and I said, come for lunch. So he flew in for one day. We went to lunch together in our favorite pub, 10 Downing Street in Hyderabad. And then I told him this whole story saying that, hey, can we do this? And his response was like, he asked me like, are you sure you want to do this? Because education is such a messy business. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Then he, said, well, then he said, where do I sign? And then he left post lunch, having agreed to move baggage back to Hyderabad. And then a month, a couple of months later, he showed up and then he became the head of the academy. And I think that was the big turning point. So yeah, to answer your question, the core expertise came originally from the founding team members like Madhu and Ashokan. And these cohorts, like the testing cohort was how long? Like the duration? And was it like full day or was it like a part-time one? Or? Oh, no part-time. The Sprint has a reputation in the coding bootcamp of being fairly brutal. We were technically eight hours a day, but students were here 16 hours a day for three months. And and I, I one of the common things we always say is that you, know, you learn more in four months in Dallas Sprint than four years of college. Right. And that was the mission that we had. And we kept our word. I think students would look back and say that this is amazing. In fact, today also, I would say that whenever I land in Delhi, Bombay or some unknown place that I'm traveling to, uh, somebody other the airport will approach me and say, you know what, I'm like third batch talent sprint from 2010 or 14th batch from 2014. And then I say, what are you doing now? I'm a project manager at Accenture or I'm an architect at TCS. It's such a common thing to see. Mm, amazing. Okay. And uh, it, you must have had to spend on uh, physical infra, right? Because you would need like a computer lab and a classroom and all of that to get yeah. started, which would have been from your own savings, I guess. Answer is yes and no. We needed all that, but we didn't spend much money. Let me tell you how. One of the big institutions in Hyderabad, where we are located, is Triple IT. The Triple IT Hyderabad is a top computer science school. And Triple IT Hyderabad at that time was in its earlier days and they had built a bunch of buildings, like unfinished buildings. And they had, at that point in time, running short on funds to finish those buildings. And they were like sitting there in the campus as unfinished buildings. So I remember walking in one day with my co-founder, Jay, and talking to the director, Rajiv Sangal, and I said, sir, why don't you rent us this unfinished building and we will convert this into classrooms. And then they said, that's interesting. And then I said, after five years of using it, we'll leave the building for you to use in its finished state. You will just walk away. So give us this building at a low rate and give us five years of uh, rental at a low rate. And that's it. And I must tell you, that was the best thing we ever did because very soon students are coming saying that, oh, I'll spend inside Triple IT. Yeah, Triple IT is such a great institution. So we are going to Triple IT campus to get trained. And that going to Triple IT campus to get trained gave us enormous aura. So what turned out to be like a very good solution also became an asset as we went along. Amazing. By when did you set up the Triple IT campus? I think within the 2010 summer, we had moved in. So a year after we really got going. Yes. And then we did five years there. And I think our reputation as a high-end institution began because Triple IT's aura was always rubbing off on us. Okay. Amazing. Like 
year one, uh, what did you close at? Like uh, how many students or what top line or whatever? How did that evolve over the subsequent years? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long journey. But I would say that the first year, I think we did about four or five crores. Hmm. And uh, we did... pretty phenomenal for a bootstrapped startup. Yeah, correct. And then, of course, we started getting more and more focused in terms of building out our teams and so forth. So I would say first year we did probably about four cohorts or five or six cohorts. I would say five or six cohorts we did. And, uh, and things started to happen pretty fast after that. Yeah, so I would say that the lesson we learned, and in a way, the solution we found, which is physical bootcamp, was very comforting for the students, comforting for us, comforting for the recruiters. But very soon it became by itself a challenge because you realize that you can't really scale too much by doing physical all the time. And then at some point in a few years, we started thinking about how to scale digital. So because you hit peak capacity, like your premises could not accommodate more cohorts and you wanted to continue to scale faster. What was the trigger to decide to go beyond physical? Yeah, so digital came a little later, but what happens is, so by the time 2011 comes along, there is this new institution that's been set up in Delhi called the National Skill Development Corporation or NSDC, which was set up by the UPA2 government. And at that time, SDC was itself starting up and they were going around trying to spot interesting entrepreneurs and companies that they could invest in. And uh, one day, the then CEO, the founding CEO, Dilip Chanoy, who's a very well-known person, so Dilip walks in through the door in Talent Sprint and the Tripadi campus and he says, you know what, I've been hearing about you guys. I want to put some money here. And it was a venture debt. And then, so we got some money from them and then we decided to, and then I think Economic Times wrote an article about us. And then, the next thing that happened was Nexus, who's our investor, venture capital firm, Nexus. Anup Gupta one day called me and said, I want to come and visit. So finally, we spent like the first one year trying to raise money out successfully, then went to bootstrap. And then the third year, we were getting inbound interest from investors. Quite an interesting, I would say, experience. Just when you stopped trying, things mm. started happening. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. How much did you raise that in the third year? Like from both of these entities? Yeah, so I think, so Nexus gave us about 20 crores and of equity. And then, of course, we got about 10 crores commitment. Not money in the bank, but commitment from NSDC in tranches. Nexus was, of course, very clear. No tranches. Just take the check and get uh, start running. So, yeah, we suddenly, we had money. and But by then, all the bad habits were also forming. You were starting to hire ahead of time and you were trying to do all kinds of experiments. And, you know, one moment you get some money, they get, you get a lot of pressure to scale up. And, uh, and then I think we realized that scaling up is going to be a challenge in this business because much of what we're doing was very high touch. And, and then came the next phase, there was a lot of discussion on how to scale and so forth. Yeah, but the short answer is that when investors are involved, professional investors, there's no choice in slowing down. If you don't have the luxury of saying, I do it slow. What was the peak revenue for the physical early model? I think the peak revenue of physical for the coding boot camps probably hit about 25 crores at the peak. Amazing. Like what location? 25 crores. That's amazing. One location. We are also experimenting with Bangalore, with Chennai. We were just setting up small centers. They were going up. They were going down. And the markets also had a lot of churn. And I think last but not the least, I would argue that by the time we were talking about 2011-12, industry was changing. Industry was no longer looking for people who knew the basic theory. The whole shift moved towards experiential learning. I always say now, today, if you say that what do you know versus what can you do? The, the real employable person is somebody who can do something, not who knows something. I always say that if you say that, what have you studied? And the guy says, I've studied computer science. And I said, okay, so what can you do? And I have this habit of telling people that skill is a verb and not a noun. If you say that I know physics, well, that's really noun. But if you say I can write a program, then it's a skill. It's a verb. So I always say that Indian education system prioritizes nouns over verbs. So we end up saying Java, C plus operating systems. But if you talk to a student in America, they will say, I know how to code, analyze, write, present, document, and synthesize. They're all verbs, right? So I think real skills are verbs. And somehow our education system, including what we saw at the first generation of these skilling companies, people are focusing on teaching people syntax, theory, concepts. But if you ask people to come out and say, what can you build? Their equivalent transfer concept to practice was always big. So therefore, one of the philosophies that we adopted, and this is our belief system, is that if a professor is talking too much, then the student is not going to learn too much. So we always say that the more you speak, the less they learn. So the best way of teaching is to not say too much. In other words, give them problems to solve and be there to help them solve it. Don't try to tell them how to solve it. Don't try to give them lectures. 
So we have a very anti-lecture pedagogical approach that the more a teacher talks, the less they will learn. Okay, amazing. I think I'll give you an example of that. So for example, we would have a system where the instructor would come into a classroom, 50 students, all of them with computers in front of them, each of them having their personal computers to work on. And then the instructor would say, here is a new language called Haskell with them speaking one, right? Those of you who know Java, go read up the syntax of Haskell. And the documentation is online. You can go search for it and Google. You can find the documentation or you can go to a portal and get the documentation and solve the, let's say, the bubble sort problem using Haskell and walk out. And then student would say, I don't know how to do this. And the instructor would say, well, neither do I. Why don't you figure it out? Yeah, right? amazing. <laughs> okay. Because the whole idea was to simulate the workplace, right? The idea was to simulate the workplace. After four years of college, if you give them four more, four mo more months of more college, Nothing will change. But if you give them four months of the workplace, then that will actually change something. Because in a workplace, no one's going to give you instruction on how to solve something. They want to say, here's a document, here's a problem, here's a person, figure out what to do. And that's we always said that you give them a taste of what their life will be and don't give them an extension of their college experience. They, the physical product sounds pretty amazing. How did you manage to take it? Digital. A lot of these things are this kind of interaction. You said students were on campus for 16 hours a day, that kind of immersion, the peer learning, the inspiration. How did you convert these things into digital? Tell me about that journey. When you Once you realize that you need to go digital to scale. Yeah. Let me tell you what actually happened right along the way. There's a bit of a, we have at least two or three pivots along the way of this company, right? This is what today is not what was happening then. We have multiple steps in between. So I got to fill in at a high level. So what happened was we came to a point after four or five years of doing this saying that this was really not going to go global by any means or national by any means at this rate. And we said, no, what can you we... personally face that franchisee problem that like you were saying, you tried back yeah. or yeah, yes. okay. we tried many things and the results were always very, very unsatisfactory. And so there came a time when we said, how can we make software coding boot camps digital? And globally at that time, uh, by 2012, 13, 14. By 14, there was a universal acceptance that whoever was trying coding boot camps anywhere in the world, and there were quite a few very fun, highly funded companies in the US that were trying it, like Flatiron, General Assembly. They were all concluding that it's almost impossible to teach coding online in the way you described. So there was a consensus that this is not working. So then we said, this is not a good idea right, to do, keep doing this. So what we said was, can we find an alternative employability program, which is not, does not involve programming, that we can use where digital will work. And in those days, 2015 was a very interesting year in India because uh, there was a lot of talk about how banks and government needs a lot of employees. Suddenly these common bank exams and government exams, provincial officer exams, special officer exams, all of these were like just catching on. And we said, you know what, this is test prep. Those exams are test prep. So can we do test prep online for job, not for JE or anything like that, just for jobs that people aspire for. And those exams were like 15, 20, 30 lakh people writing those exams. So we said, okay, let's try something here. And, uh, and in a way, that second part, which we added as our second stream, the coding bootcamps continued, physical world. We added digital world where we said no classrooms at all, only digital test prep for jobs in banking and in the government sector. And the start was very promising. We got this fantastic team of people that came and worked with us that time. And then our CTO, Jitendra Singh, who was an IIT Kanpur dad, built this phenomenal online platform that even today has been one of our strengths. And that platform allowed us to reach students across the country. So all of a sudden, we were having students from Manipur to Kashmir to Tingon learning on our platform. Hmm. So that was actually one, one or two quick questions here. This was cohort based or this was like self paced cohort based. Please record it. Okay, cohort based. Co cohort based so like live classes. Yes, oh, cohort based originally, and then we started doing async and hybrid and all of that. And and I can talk about that if you wish. But we spent about two three years in, in that time trying to perfect this model, and we realized that and finally the uh, it was interesting. We picked the perfect answer, but. The model itself was a problem because the price points of these courses never exceeded 10,000 rupees. No matter what you did, you could never charge more than 10,000 because somebody else was doing this at much cheaper. And this was the beginning of the edtech funding thing. So there were pure online companies coming and saying, we'll give you something for free or all of that. So we started running into this problem of comparison thing that, okay, we have quality products, they have great outcomes. But 
the kind of students who write these exams where budgets were capping at 2,000 to 5,000 rupees. And then we realized that this is a, another problem, that we had problems in the first model that we tried to solve through the second model. The second model has new problems to solve, which is how do you charge 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 for this model? And finally, again, after trying for some time, we concluded that this is not going to be the way we want to build a company because we are just spending too much time trying to create a low price product. Even though everything we had in the system was high touch and high, high technology, great customer service, all of that. So great reviews. And I think we built that business to about four or five crores. And then we lost interest because we said we cannot make this a big business. And what was really the real benefit of that phase two was we built a great digital platform. Right. So now we are ready for phase three. Phase three was when the finally it all came together. Okay. It, Before we start phase three, I want to ask some questions about phase two. 10,000 average course price was not enough. Was it because of high customer acquisition costs where you had to yes. spend a lot to acquire? The, and 10,000 wasn't sticking either. 10,000 would be the MRP and you'd end up selling a six. So you were constantly fighting this, somebody else is offering at a lower price game. And which has become the nature of the internet today, right? And the YouTube had free content. There was somebody doing, who's a YouTuber doing this alone. So there was all kinds of stuff. And I think in, in some sense, it seems obvious now in hindsight that very hard to price these things that are premium. But because there's always a very rapid commodity thinking that comes around it. And people start offering it as solo, right? And, and it becomes like a tuition business online. So yeah, so short answer is that we it didn't really fly for us and we decided that we have better things to do in our life and also a crowded space uh, primarily yes. Yes. yes and there was a also a question that okay technology platform part how do we differentiate ourselves because we are ultimately tech guys coming from the tech industry and uh, if we can't really scale up our phone technology training then why are we doing the sideshow yes. there was an internal debate saying that what special value do we bring to this is there a better way to teach that we are bringing mm. Anyway, so what happened then was a decision. And I must say one of the more interesting decisions where I one day just told that we are shutting this business, mm. right? Mm. Mm. And there was a human cry from one set of people in the company. And another set of people said, I think finally common sense has prevailed. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was an interesting phase. But I would say that everybody agreed that we need to go back to our base. Mm. Mm. And then came the third I think I would say the most important piece that fell, fell in place when... And this, when is, this? When uh, this is about uh, yeah, 2015, 17, I think we... Uh, yeah, late 16, early 17, we shut down this. Yeah. So then at that time, uh, something very interesting happened. Triple IT Hyderabad itself, which historically has been a very, I would say, academically pure organization. And they have their bachelor's, master's and PhD programs, etc. Suddenly one day... And one of the deans is in my office and uh, he's a friend for many years. And he says that, are we not reading these newspapers? Like 2017, I remember, was the first time the Indian media went crazy about AI, right? There was this starting to write about AI and how AI will change everything, all the jobs will vanish and IT will disappear and so forth. And I also started noticing something very peculiar in those days. 2017 was the first time in my life I remember getting on a plane in India in an Indigo flight and realizing that until then, I was always watching IT professionals who were working in the IT sector. And doctors were now working professionals, not freshers, but people in the industry. They would all love to carry, until 2017, this fat book called Program Manager, Project Manager Certification, PMP. Mm, PMP, PMP. Certification, yeah, yeah, yeah. PMP, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. PMP books were very popular in those days. And every techie was trying to become a project manager because that's how we got a career growth reenhancement. So if you became a manager, you would then get to manage people. If you manage people, then you had more esteem and prestige and then you'd get more money and your marriage market would be much better and God knows what else. This whole idea that you want to be a good IT professional, you start becoming a manager and you escape technology, right? So then in 2017, that started changing. All of a sudden, the PMP books disappeared. People were carrying data science books. They tried to carry AI and machine learning books. And I said, this is interesting. And I had, yeah, exactly. And I had this theory that Maybe the wheels are turning. Maybe we will see a rush from management to technology again in terms of skill sets. And the media did a really good job of scaring people, saying that if you are in the IT sector and you don't know AI and all of that, your days are numbered. So I'm sitting in my office talking to Ramesh, who was from Triple IT, and Professor Ramesh Logan after that, and we're sitting and having this conversation. We said, you know what? Triple IT is one of the best AI faculty in the world. Why don't we start a program? 
for working professionals in AI, right? Upskilling IT professionals in AI. And that really was the big turning point because everybody loved the idea. And we said business schools are really famous for start running executive education in, in, in leadership, in strategic finance, and all of that good stuff. Why don't tech schools, the best ones, run executive education? Because the future of executive education might be technology and not management. And, and that insight, I think, was powerful. And we decided to launch the first AI machine learning program between IIIT and Talent Sprint, which was an instant hit. And now all our strengths were playing to us, right? We were a tech company. We were having a platform. We were doing classroom. We were doing online. And all of that came together. And from then on, I think we got the third big lift. And I think that pivot is what got us to where we are today. Okay. Uh, what did you price this course in? The AI ML course? Off the bat, you were doing 2 lakh rupees per student, right? Because these are working professionals and these people have disposable income. And for a young professional, learning is a way to get the first job. But for somebody who's 30 years old, who's got an IT career, has two mortgages to pay, two kids in school, the, they are buying career insurance, right? For them, it became a really important decision because people are more scared of what they lose than what they can gain, right? So in that sense, when they have something to lose, people become far more focused. And plus, of course, if you're in the IT sector for 10 years, you have disposable income and then and, and, and we are able to show that this was the starting point. Once that became successful, IIMs and IITs and started coming to us, right? And then we started creating this program. Today we have like 30 such programs, not one, across various. And so we essentially we realized that we are good at young professionals coding boot camps. We are good at working professionals to do upskilling of new technologies. And once that got going and the pandemic happened, then the coding bootcamp, everybody accepted that, yes, we can learn coding online as well. I think the pandemic was the first time that young professionals also accepted that we have to and we can learn coding online. So there we are after all that. Okay. This uh, AI ML course was how long, the duration? Yeah. All of these programs that we offer for working professionals were about six months, about 120 hours to 150 hours total on weekends. So they would be like, five, six, seven, eight hours of commitment per weekend that a student would have to put in. And they would attend a lot of live lectures online, sometimes come into the campus, do a lot of lab work online. And then all the good things we had put into our system in the second phase, now the technology platform was our biggest differentiator. But to answer your question, working professionals like part-time, six-month, weekend-only programs. And, and that's largely 80% to 90% digital games. And did you need to offer placement support for this? Because so these are already working professionals. So I, yeah, they don't need it. Working professionals don't really need placement support. And one thing we also decided was that if you see too many people asking for placement support in a working professional program, you're probably attracting the wrong kind of working professional. Because these are people probably are struggling in their current jobs and they're therefore using us as a placement engine. So we decided to offer more networking services rather than placement services. And by that, so let's say today, there'd be often companies coming to us and saying, we are looking for a bunch of data scientists. We know you have this great competition data science program with ISC Bangalore. If we post a job in your system, could you please ask the people in this program who was interested can apply? And we would take consent from the students and post it to them. So we play the role of saying, okay, here is some opportunity for you if you want to apply. But we never say that we will help you find a job. That we only offer to the work, young professionals. Okay. So uh, how did the sales happen then? For your young professional courses, the job was a big part of spreading word of mouth, helping you get sales. Over here, how, how did the sales happen? How did you do your lead generation? How was the conversion done? Uh, tell me about that. So the first and foremost marketing brand that came to us is that Triple IT, IIC, IIT Kanpur, IIT Calcutta, they're all partnering with Diamond Sprint to offer joint programs. That brand itself had a word of mouth. Then there was then there is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is perhaps the biggest place for us to announce new programs and promote existing programs, talk about success stories and so forth. So then LinkedIn, uh, the LinkedIn marketing, we spent a lot of money there. We also spend a lot of money on Google AdWords, which in any case, everybody and anybody who wants to search for something will go to Google and search. So if they say a data, course in data science, if you type, you will get programs from us. So we were doing a lot of that. So it became a digital marketing. Digital marketing became very big for us in this process. And I would say today, the biggest differentiator is that we are a serious platform for serious learners because serious learners want an ISC, I have intense experience. 
because while it is glamorous to say I'm taking this program, these programs are also fairly brutal in terms of their expectation from students. And these top schools don't like giving out exact education certificates just because somebody's willing to pay. They want to make you really slog, right? So therefore, we have taken a view that we want to be a platform that offers serious programs to serious learners. If you're a non-serious learner who wants to get an easy certificate, we are not that platform. And that itself has a brand. So I realized after a while that taking a posture that we are not all things to all people in executive education, I think that gave us a lot of brand as well. Take one simple example. You look at ISC Bangalore, a number one ranked institution in the country for so many years. They have only one in the entire 120 year history. There's only one private partner with whom they have worked, which is Talent Spirit, and they continue to work with us to launch new programs. So we therefore created that premium effect. And that I think has been our marketing. Okay. And how does the lead conversion happen? Like you have a, like the, once the lead comes in, that someone calls that person and uh, takes them through the process, I guess, because for such a high ticket, it would not be like an online checkout. No, it's not an online checkout. So what happens is you're right. So campaigns run and once the campaigns run, people come through, they click through on the campaign and then that information is captured again through a system. So there is fairly significant digital marketing that happens at the platform. And then we track behavior of a lead over time. There is a way of scoring the system to score the lead and say, how much time are they spending looking at our various websites? How often do they open our emails? We don't call them the moment they click. We just, the system takes over and observes the behavior and says that the attributes to scores to all the behaviors. And there's a threshold score. So if the engagement behavior is a threshold, it hits the inbox of a counselor and the counselor will then place a call saying that we think he would be interested in this. So the other part of being a serious player is that we have made it very clear that we are not going to be like counting people by calling them. So you just click on a link and before you know it, you get five calls a day. We just said no, no such thing, right? So therefore, again, a more patient approach, a lot, of, lot more systems behind the scenes to observe how much engagement we are seeing and then acting according. That's as much an art as a science. There's always debate around, are we missing, shouldn't we be calling more often, more people? Are we calling too slowly, too fast? These debates continue. For example, in 2018, we started working with Google on this famous program called Women Engineers, where we work with young women students from second tier towns, identify them in their first year of college and who have high potential for becoming world-class programmers. So we have this really fascinating program called Women Engineers, where we pick about 250 students a year from across India, from about close to 35, 40,000 applications come in every year. Pick 250 students and then they go on a full Google scholarship at Talent Sprint for two years. And at the end of it, you'll be shocked to hear that 20, 25% end up in Google and the rest end up in Microsoft and Amazon, right? So we have fit these models now where we are partnering with top tier companies in the world to build coding boot camps, uh, often funded and underwritten by the companies themselves to create world-class talents. But but I would say that since we work with the top brands, I think it has been a good experience part of that. Okay. And in terms of numbers, revenue, tell me a bit about that, for the digital business. What is the size of the cohort you did in the first year? Like 17, you lost this. How has that evolved now? Yeah, so today, if you look at it, so we have reached a point where we are doing about maybe 10, 15,000 students a year across our fresher and uh, working professionals level at various combinations. I think today, I would say that maybe 60% of our revenue comes from the working professionals and 20% comes from young professionals. And and of course, if you really look at the number of students, because the price points are much lower for young students, I think those the same 40,000 we had talked about 10 years ago is now priced at 75, 80,000 because that market really cannot pay a whole lot more. At one lakh, it will max out young professionals. So we've tried to keep things a little affordable for the young professionals and priced more premium on the working professionals. So my theory is that we have to continue to reap benefit from the working professionals to invest in the young professionals. It's like a transfer of support from one to the other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And is it still like life classes uh, for all of these like cohort-based life classes or how is that product evolved? So it is a lot of online live interactive classes. So the physical world has gone, but the liveness of the interaction has not. It has been replaced by a digital classroom. So digital classrooms are the way to go. And I think, so there's been studies to show. In fact, if you look at the studies of this area for the last 10 years, the whole MOOC revolution that happened, Coursera is of the world, you realize that, you know, the idea that if you make content asynchronous and non cohort based 
somehow people will learn at their own leisure. That theory is not working, right? That theory is not yeah, working. Yeah, the so completion rates are very poor. Abysmal. So what that tells you is that we are social learners. We learn in good, we, it's like hunting in packs. We learn in groups. We learn in packs. So there's been a return to this idea that's called CBL or cohort-based learning, right? So what we used to think is the important part. It used to believe that cohorts are less important, but physical classroom is important. In reality, cohorts are very important. And the physical classroom becoming a digital classroom is not an impediment at all. So what you have today is that digital cohorts as opposed to physical cohorts. And what you have is that I will learn it by own pace, asynchronously, MOOC, self-contained. I think that part isn't really working as we know from the results. So our theory, which I think is backed up by some decent amount of research, that cohort-based learning on digital platform gives you the best of all worlds. Right, And the technology is now sophisticated enough that people can work. You've seen after the pandemic, the workplace, and we have Teams, we have Zoom, we have all of this. The technology for learning also has come enough that we can create a team. You can create a team of five participants who are geographically in five different cities, but working as a single team on the same project. And a mentor is hanging around in the digital room helping them out. So that is not a problem anymore. So we've tried to rebuild the entire model with everything that's the same except the physical becoming digital. Okay, okay. Like uh, for coding, maybe you have coding simulators where they're working collaboratively. Uh, the instructor can also look at what code they're writing and so on. Absolutely. So coding actually turns out the simulator world is quite advanced now, right? People can write and submit code. The systems can do the evaluations most of the time. Then people can do peer review of code. Yeah, we are discovering to our, to as a positive surprise that once the mental barrier went away, like just as we always said that Oh, we can't work from home, but we now can. We have realized that we can't code if you are not sitting in front of an instructor. It turns out that you can code, learn to code while it, as part of a cohort, even if you're not in the same place as the cohort or the instructor. So I think technology now allows us to do a lot of these things quite well. And But I think the problem with coding remains that unless we give students something to solve, you don't really get the outcome. So our whole model is problem solving is the real method. You give people tools, technology, support, peer group, mentoring. But what you really give them is hard problems to solve, which get, they start off simple, but as you make progress, you get harder and harder to solve. And problem solving done right, or what we call competition problem solving, and the skill set is competition problem solving, meaning the problem is such that you can have an algorithmic solution, right? Then I think pedagogy seems to be working quite well. Mm -hmm. There would be some people who would be more proficient than others. So do you have that like segregation of batches and so on? Or, like how does how do you deal with yeah. that? Like yes. if it's learning speeds and abilities. Yeah. Two extreme very good questions. The two two answers I'll give you in a different sort of way. Uh, two very different answers. One answer is very often you have to run something called pre-module. So before the courses begin, we call it module zero. Uh, because people come from different backgrounds and in the case of working professionals, somebody has been out of college for 10 years, somebody's out of 15 years, somebody's out of five years, very differential situation. So they have forgotten their basic math, basic statistics, and they're here to learn AI, right? All of which you can't learn without that. So we offer refreshers. So first of all, you often offer module zero as a refresher before the course starts to normalize this delta, right? So people come in and say, okay, do this course, just refresh get your basic concepts back and then you start. So we spend some time trying to synchronize the starting point so that people don't start with a great disadvantage. So that's one way of solving this problem that you just talked about. The other problem is actually a very interesting problem to say that despite your best efforts, no class is never going to have a homogeneous group. As the class progresses, some will learn faster, some will learn slowly, some will learn at the normal pace. And you can always have people who are overperforming, performing or underperforming. And this is true for every education system in the world, not just us. And what happens typically in a college or school is that the professors latch on to the overperformers, deliver for them, at best try to pay attention to the performers, and the underperformers leave the class very dissatisfied and not being able to even get the basics right. This whole concept has been illustrated quite extensively by Sal Khan from Khan Academy. If you look at his TED lectures, he talks about this idea that you know, the problem in education is tenure-based. We say that you spend one year in a particular grade, eighth grade, and then one year in ninth grade. And he said that, imagine if you're trying to build a house in which the architect says that I'll spend three months building the foundation and then in three months, if it's not complete, I'll start building the ground floor. And yeah. after three months, after it's not complete, I'll build the first floor because I'm tenure-based, right? Yeah. And he said the tenure-based makes no sense in education. What makes is outcome-based 
or competency based, what we call competency based. So some people can get to grade eight in three months, some in 12 months, and some in 24 months. You must allow them to go through it and complete and get the competency, right? So our education is not proficiency or competency based. It tends to be very tenure based, which is a problem. So now back to the point. In our assessment, so all our courses have ongoing weekly assessments. So the system is observing who is overperforming, who is underperforming. Let's say you and I are the same class. We're taking the same tests together every weekend. You are overachieving, right? You are like performing at a speed where you can graduate not in six months, but perhaps in four months, right? And I'm proceeding at a speed where six months is too short for me. I need eight months to graduate, right? The system is observing this for my test performance and your test performance. System then kicks in. And without even having to consult with the instructor, the system will start doing things. It will start saying to me that here are three videos that you should watch. Because I looked at your last test performance. You were good in some things. You were weak in some things. If you really watch these three videos, the weak area that you are falling behind, you can catch up. And I can watch these videos without anybody in my class ever knowing that the system gave yeah. those videos to watch. Recommendations. Yeah. What we call recommendation yeah. systems. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you may be doing so well that instead of sending you remedial videos, it will send you the next class. You should watch this before the next class because then you can go through that even faster. So the system, so this is the innovation that we have done, that we are able to create a system behind the scenes where instructors do their job, but the system is complementing the instructor by supplementing some people, remediating other people, feeding up some people, helping people are slowing down, catch up, and all of that, purely through recommendation content, right? That's an example of the benefit of technology-based learning. I would never do this in a physical classroom. Yeah. But the tenure uh, is fixed or is the tenure also flexible? Like uh, you have a four-month course. Uh, can I take six months to complete it if I am a slow learner? The tenure, if you are done learning slow, we will give you more time. No doubt about it. For example, if your final exam is unsatisfying, then you can take another attempt and we'll give you more time. So that, So letting people do things for longer is not a problem. If somebody says, oh, this is too simple, I can graduate in two months. I think we can't allow that yet. We don't have a way of letting people graduate sooner. We'll still ask them to do more. But the problems and projects are like the whole cohort is doing those projects and problems together. So That's one. And the other thing is that the more fundamental issue is that in the last 200 years, education has become a business, right? And mm -hmm. if somebody says that, why am I paying so much tuition for two months when I'm finishing yeah. two months? Yeah. And yeah. So... The whole business model around things will start to break once you break tenure. Got it. Yeah, people will say, you know what, I didn't need so much resources from you, so why are you charging me the same as somebody else? Mm -hmm. We don't know how to differentiate tuitions or pricing. And the whole education system in the world is based on tenure. If you break the tenure model, mm -hmm. a lot of business models will collapse. Got it. What about when you go to a college, you're not just interacting with your batchmates, but there are multiple courses and you have that community which gets built around the college yeah. and at alumni, like a... Once you're an alumni, then that's also a lifelong thing. So what are some of the things you're doing there, like to enable that sort of community as an asset? Yeah. And like a lifelong alumni, yes. like that alumni base as an asset. We are building an alumni connect system, which is since early stages when it's going okay. But I think by definition, we are not a full-scale educational platform, right? We don't give out degrees. We don't hold people for years and years. It's not a four-year, not a two-year model. We are essentially an intervention. Right. Why do people need us? They need us for an intervention, right? So therefore, our ability to create a lifelong bond is, in my view, fairly limited. However, it's critical because most people will not consume our products multiple times. It is important for us to build a great word of mouth for reference. So we need a referral system. And therefore, alumni are our best referral possibility. And then we have a 40% referral rate even in a coding book campus business and so forth. Yeah. So the point is that, yes, building an alumni connect that is successful is a dream. It's something we are pursuing. What is the percentage split of source of conversion? What percentage comes from the referral of students? What percentage comes through digital marketing? Yeah. I think the good answer would be that in a best program, which are highly popular I've even seen 60% reference, but then on average as a company, maybe 35 to 40% reference, one out of three students, and two would come through campaigning. Yeah, so I would say one third referral, two third campaign is a fairly stable metric over time, but there are variations where in some programs, it might be even more than 50% reference. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, do you spend the marketing beyond performance marketing? Say, I don't know, Ventex uh, spend on YouTube as a channel, like building up YouTube community, posting free educational content just to build brand and so on. Yes. I think in our business, that's absolutely non-negotiable. You have to do that for SEO. You have to do that for reputation. You have to do that for brand building and all of that. We have been, I think we've been doing it and we have been doing it very, I would say systematically, but not in a very loud sort of way because we have never, I think definitely we've never been very comfortable with the idea of just doing a lot of PR, loud PR. And I think one of the reasons why the top institutions like IITs and IS like working with talent sprint because they find us to be like-minded. They don't want a partner who's always painting the town red with something or the other. So in that sense, I think our approach is more thoughtful and little more, I would say, low-key. But we do it all the time. The content is available and content is being used for SEO and for lead gen all the time. But it is happening, in some sense, very targeted to people who need it. So if you are, I always joke that if my grandmother knows about talent it's a big problem because when I'm wasting marketing money in the wrong audience, she's neither going to go for upskilling nor going to look for a first job. So therefore... I don't need marketing to be all things to be all people. Scholarship programs that you told me, like the one you do with Google, like how do you ensure engagement there because the student is not paying anything, but does that uh, come in as a factor or uh, the students are engaged because it's a great opportunity for them? Yeah. So engagement is a function of how you select, right? Also, not just the money you pay. So for example, the way this program has evolved into now it's in the fifth cohort is that every year in the month of February or March, we announce that the next cohort is going to be now created and please apply. And that goes out to all the universities in the country and to, and also on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, etc. Students apply. Last year, we got 35,000 applications from across all states and perhaps about 400, 500 universities and colleges. And 30,000 young women who are in the first year of college applied. And from that, we picked two. Then we run a fairly sophisticated selection process, three stage selection process with 250 selections. Now, the kids who are making into the system are already going through a fairly high rigor of selection. And therefore, we know that they're motivated because their goal in life is to get a job in Google or Amazon or Microsoft start. So we are selecting for the most hungriest and the most I would say, ambitious crowd up front. Once they're in, there is also the following. So they get a stipend. They get the education free. They also get a stipend to buy laptops and stuff like that that they will need, which is also very nice. Yeah. And then they are, the, the, so the two-year program is also structured that at the end of first year, they can apply for internships in Google and other companies. So now they know that if they decide to just not be engaged, they're going to miss on all those opportunities. So first of all, you select the people who are ambitious, then you put milestones in front of them that are reachable, like internships, multiple kinds of internships, then additional awards, coding hackathons, etc. So they tend to be, if anything, they tend to spend more time on this and their own college education because they realize quickly that what they're learning here has far better career value and outcome. Also, one of the real beautiful things about this program is that while the education part is taken care of by Talent Sprint, there is a mentoring network of Google engineers who are allocated to this program who are Google engineers, the Google employees, they mentor three, four students each throughout the entire program, giving them ideas on how to prepare for interviews, how to write a resume. They give them mock interviews. Then they give them this idea that, okay, Google also is not exception to the rule. I decided that Google has enough problems with its own and gender diversity, as we all know. So therefore, if you're a women engineer, what kind of problems can you expect to face? So all these mentors are also women engineers in Google, right? So there's a lot of surround effect that is going around. It is not just training. It is training, it's mentoring, it's preparing, it's goals and milestones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would say that the end of it, completion rates are like 99, 98, 99%. And placement rates are 100%. And these kids are brown. They just post about their success on LinkedIn and go on. Some of them, I mean, last year, three years ago, one of the students won the National Coding Competition. So these are serious players. But they're not here just to spend, spend time because you can't. This program is so serious that we also drop students. If somebody is not progressing and we don't think they'll make it, we will drop them in the middle of the program. So the fear of elimination is actually also a motivation to do on the right. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. I feel that today an edtech company also needs to be a fit tech company because 
if you're able to figure out ways of financing the cost to your customer through financial engineering, through PL options, through income sharing, and a lot of techs have different approaches in which they're doing it. So tell me about that element for you, like the, the fit tech element uh, or financing that. Are you looking at income sharing and or PL or any of those? Yeah. Good question. In fact, so the first part is easy that we have, I think one of the earliest pioneers in this idea of uh, Zero percent EMI schemes, or in other words, VNPL, or even one of the pioneers in this idea of zero percent EMI schemes. In fact, BNPL before it was called BNPL, we had started working going back now 2017-18 on how to provide our learners with good financing solutions. And this is generally it was called training financing in those days, but now it's called fintech for edtech. So therefore, if you look at it from that perspective, you'd be surprised to hear even Bajaj. Kinsa uh, began their first education product with Talent Sprint. That is my that is why I made the point earlier that I look at this as a consumer product, right? If you think of what we're offering is a white collar consumer product, a white coat consumer product, then you know that's how it started. And then of course there's a whole lot of startups that came in the last few years, and today we work with all of them. So typically, if you are a, somebody joining a Talent Sprint program, you are eligible to apply for this. It's a fairly quick session, a few points of data about yourself electronic KYC, and within three to five minutes, you'll get a decision on whether they approve or not for EMI. And we have a whole bunch of providers for this. So 0% EMI for 12 to 18 months is a tough deal. And I would say 50% of our customers are using it. Yeah. So that to me is fantastic because the subvention works in the way that we get paid our cash early. Again, going back to your earlier point about working capital, our cash comes up front. And then the, the fintech company would work with the student or the learner to recover over a period of time. And that's, I think, working very well. If I look at this, and if I contrast this to the ISA agreement, I think ISAs are a big danger. And um, just, ISAs, if you could clarify ISA for our listeners, it's an interest income. income. A lot of people income sharing, income, understand income sharing. what it means. Yeah. Mm. I, ISA means income sharing agreements. And what that really means as a concept is that I will learn as a student today, and then you will incur as a in platform, you will teach me. And then when I finish, if I get a job, I will start paying you back in some kind of an installment fashion, the learning. And it's, in some sense, it's like what education knows used to be from a bank. If you went to did an MBA, the bank loan, that is how it would look. Right? I think it's like venture debt, I guess, where it's a yes, yeah. percentage of what you write. Now, there, are, there is data from South America and other countries that income sharing agreements seem to have worked for many companies. But in India, it has not worked for many companies well and certainly has not been something that we have been very comfortable with. Because frankly, the delta between when the costs are incurred and when the revenue comes in is just too long. It's like having a cash collection cycle that is two years or three years behind the delivery. What that does is it actually is obviously very bad for our cash flows, but it's probably even more insidious in the sense that many students, when they are successful, do not attribute their success back to the people who put them to the system. So what next for you? Do you see this as your final journey or is there one more venture in you? I, uh, yeah. So I have, I mean, I can give you a lot of answers to that question, but to summarize, I would say that I have another year to go on this particular, so it's a three-year CEO contract that I'm working on. And, uh, and I've told myself that I do not want to rush into my next what next? Because I don't want to fill up my current time with anxiety about the future. So I'm just living it in a much more comfortable way. I have a lot of different interests. So I can see myself as one thread doing another gig as an entrepreneur. I can see myself heading a much larger organization, either for profit or even non-profit. And I can see myself becoming a writer and a podcaster, much like you. That's another thing that I've always wanted to do. And I'm also, by the way, I have a lot of interest in, I'm a huge foodie and a chef, so I love all that. So, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I'll do, to be honest. Uh, one last question. Where does the talent spread stand in terms of the overall executive education market? Who are the other major players that? Where would you rank? Yeah. Would you be in the top two, in the top five? Yeah, I think we'll be in the top five if you go by revenue. We'll be in the top one if you go by who is profitable and who is not. Yeah, that's but, right. <laughs> but if you go by revenue alone, I think we'll be in the top five. There are the, uh, other crazy things like Outgrad, Great Learning, which got acquired by you, Scalers. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyone else? So I was going to say, yes. I guess it's yes. Like, no, you got three good names there. Mm-hmm. Abgrat, a great learning scaler, yeah. but also mm-hmm. emeritus, okay. all simply learned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So these are the, I've been talents. I think it's four or five, six mm-hmm. names mm-hmm. will keep mm-hmm. rotating depending on what it is. I think mm-hmm. if you look at purely from a perspective of, for example, we have a very strong presence in financial service and banking programs, right? Like tech and all that, which I think we are unique in that sense. And that also is the reason why NC was attracted to us. The other thing that we are good at is, for example, I think if you look at the quality of partnerships with Indian blue chip academia, then I think we have the most sought after partners. But if you look at it from the point of view of saying that who's making the most noise in the market, certainly we are not that. And so somewhere along the way, I think perhaps by design or perhaps by accident, we have come to be seen as a serious player trying to build a serious approach to this space and doing it more patiently with a more thoughtful approach and avoiding all kinds of fanfare and gimmicks. So that's, so we are a bit of an anachronism in this era. What is your India versus outside India revenue split? And what's the roadmap there? Yeah, so we just started our international operations a year ago and uh, very, in a very happy manner, I was happy. I'm pleased to note that if you look at what happened, the Women Engineers program with Google in India was so successful and became such a template for how Google wants to do this kind of work around the world which is inclusion in, and diversity and equity in education and learning. So we got invited a year ago by Google to set up a similar model in the U.S. for minority-led institutions. As in the U.S., in the Silicon Valley terms or modern economy terms, Asian Americans, Indian Americans, and white Americans, urban, are the winners. But if you look at African Americans, Latin Americans, and rural white Americans, they are not the ones who are participating in the new economy. And therefore, that's another correction that is in the process of getting addressed. And Google asked us to replicate the same model of women engineers that we did in India in the U.S. And we set up a program called TechWise. And TechWise has started the first cohort is on. 100 students across five minority-led institutions across the U.S. are already running. And this is, I think, a great place to start because being invited by Google to set up a U.S. operation was a great moment of right for us because we didn't have to go and do any marketing. We just got invited to set up the US operation. So early days, this year we contribute a good amount of revenue, perhaps almost 5-6% of our total revenue. But I'm very optimistic that the kind of support that in that particular program is getting in Google in the US, that can expand significantly in the coming years. I'm hopeful. And I will not be surprised if the ultimate goal is to produce 1,000 students a year in the minority student category of the U.S. for top Valley companies. Apart from that, we signed with Carnegie Mellon this year for executive education. We signed with the University of Michigan this year with uh, executive education. Early days, we are in the U.S. market today where we were in India perhaps six, six, five or six years ago. So long ways to go. Yeah. I'm guessing in a couple of years, your U.S. revenue will overtake India revenue. Simply because Yeah, just the multiplier effect of conversion. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Quite possible. I hope that's true. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. And that brings us to the end of this amazing conversation. At this point of time, I'd like to make a request. I want to know what you think about the show and how we can improve it. Do you have suggestions? Do you want to discuss your startup ideas? Is there any way in which we can add more value to you as a listener? I love reading your emails and suggestions. Please write to me at ad at the podium dot in that's ad at the t h e podium p o d i u m dot in